Welcome, friends and family. Um, we thank you for being patient during our minor technical difficulties. We are now moving into the session. Um, we saw futures in the music. Um, we're gonna, so today's event is basically looking at the medium of music videos and how they can encompass or even like provoke in some spaces, visions of the future and what's possible or just like provoke something in ourselves personally that helps us move forward and see something new. So I have five incredible people joining me today who will be sharing their like favorite music videos that helped inspire something or like provoke something in them. I'm gonna go around really quickly and introduce them. And then they're gonna introduce their music videos and we'll have a little conversation and then we'll um, have like a longer Q and A a little bit later. So feel free to drop all of your comments in the box on the side because we will be taking questions towards the end of the day. Um, first up, we have Doriana Diaz, who is a Philadelphia based, um, Curator, artist, writer, just amazing person. Um, you can find her work at by Doriana Diaz um, and the Doriana Collection um, LLC. We then have Travis, uh, Travis Alabanza. Travis is an award-winning theater maker, writer and performer, um, and just a general incredible person. We also have Sham Morad in the house, who's a Baghdad born, um, masters in international relations and development. Um, Sham is also one of the founders of A for Activists book club who will be doing some stuff in the festival tomorrow. Um, we also have Caleb Bemi in the house who is a poet and director. Um, and we have Waylon McKenzie who is an audio artist looking um, at radio, um, music and podcasts. Alrighty, you can find out more about each of them online and by looking at Wagwan in the Dream Department of Dreams Festival brochure and information. We're going to jump straight in and I'm going to ask Doriana to introduce your video. I'm Doriana and I, so I chose for my music video, I chose Take a Bow by Rihanna. Um, and I also chose to compare and contrast a little bit with Man Down by Rihanna as well. Um, do you want me to explain it right? Play it. Yeah, yeah, let's watch the video and then we'll explain Wagwan. Oh my God, I'm crying in like, what was that, 10 years ago? Doriana, what made you pick yes. Um, So I remember watching Take a Bow for the first time when I was probably about 10 years old. Um, and I think it was one of the first times that I, I remember seeing a display of the self-preservation of the Black female body um, in such like a true form. Like she was light-skinned, green-eyed Caribbean woman, and so am I, and I completely identified with her. I've always identified with her, with her music, with her experience, and I remember watching her and being like, um, seeing myself in her in very um, real ways. And I think that that was completely revolutionary to me at the time. Um, I can, I, I think it's kind of take a bow, even man down is another great example of kind of the reclamation of, um, or the taking herself back from undeserving hands, you know? Um, and she really exemplifies kind of self-confidence and strength and black girl magic and fearlessness as well. Um, and she's self-defined in these videos. She's, un she's an unapologetic black woman. She's fully rooted in herself and rooted in her, uh, her fierceness. Um, and I think I remember feeling really, um, or admiring her and really inspired by, um, by her words, by, by the visuals, by, um, and kind of wanting that for myself. And, and um, it gave me something to live up to. That's so beautiful and hold yeah. on all my fellow Bajans. I remember <laughs> I up, I like whenever I say that I was Bajan, people would just be like, oh yeah, so Rihanna. And like it became a really frustrating thing because that was like the only not necessarily like overtly Caribbean pop star, right. but like it meant that right. we were as soon as we like found someone like Rihanna, it was like, oh my God, there's someone who has that same cultural um right. background from our period of time that is 
just like embodying that spirit and yeah. um, how do you think that that spirit has helped you like moving forward now do you still think about this video and what does it yeah I do I definitely do I think I think as a as a 10 year old I remember being like when I find me a man like and he fucks me up like this is how I'm going to respond to the situation or like when I get my heart broken and I think like <laughs> I think like now that I'm grown or, or growing up or evolving and changing and, and more um, having having gone through certain things like that, um, I think that looking back on like, you know, like being rooted in your inner, your inner child or channeling inner child rhythms, I think that there's a lot about her that still inspires me. There's a lot about her that I still feel like I would like to live up to uh, within myself. Um, and and I think that she gives me something to sort of lean on um, in moments that are really discouraging and harmful. Um, and I think, yeah, I think there still is a lot about her. There's also a lot about like the carefree spirit of her, um, the, caref the carefree spirit that she embodies that that reminds me, that takes me back to the first time I ever saw, saw man, um, take a bow or the first time I ever saw man down. Um, that uh, I feel like I owe it to myself. I owe it to a um, younger version of myself to uh, to do everything that I can to exemplify that and even exemplify that to my sisters um, and uh, the young women in my life, you know? So I think, yeah, absolutely. There's still so much about her that, that continues to propel me and inspire, uh, inspire me and, and give me something to celebrate. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Doriana. And I think some of the other videos are gonna to speak to what you've spoken about and we'll unpack a little bit later, but we're gonna jump back into the next video, which is, um, selected by Travis Alabanza. Do you want to do the grand reveal? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I have picked Prince and the Revolution Kiss. <laughs> oh, um, over to Travis, tell us more. I guess. Um, how did this? Yeah, well, I guess for me, like I was trying to think about when I was, um, like we didn't really have internet until like, I was trying to think about when I started watching videos and I remember like we were like still on that modem hype for a really long time and then when we finally got to be able to use it at the same time we would backtrack on all these you know, of songs that I love and I didn't know that a like I thought this is when it's like real fucked up so I'm allowed to swear shit oh. um I didn't know <laughs> I didn't know uh Age of Chance, wow. Age of Chance was the version I knew, which was some like white indie band, right? And then when I Googled the song to see their video, I realized that it was actually a Prince song. And this was at a time where I had just started, like I was in the phase of cutting my school t-shirts to make them crop tops to wear to school. Bearing in mind, I mean like, you know, a really intense, uh, like state comprehensive school where like that isn't something that like a black boy can do. And then I watched this video and I see Prince. And at the time we had a similar physique. And I was like, oh damn. And not only is he rocking the crop top, he looks really good and he's being desired. And for me, that was the, the thing that I really noted about this was it, it created a possibility that gender nonconformity could be desired. Yeah. Oh, wow. And sorry for swearing. And then sorry oh, no, for- No, please go swear away. This is, this is a swearable space. <laughs> um but I think like when I watched that video back by Prince as well like just the the like comfortability with being yourself and not asking permission for everyone else you're actually like laying down your laws and you're like actually like this is how it's going to run these are my boundaries um and it's 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 yeah it's super powerful to watch back for sure for sure um what with like how do you think the use of like music video and the me that medium that Prince used to like reimagine so often um, is kind of like plays into what we've just seen, but also the rest of Prince's career and the other music videos that link in with that same energy and spirit? Yeah, totally. And like for me, uh, once I saw that, I got hooked because I think. Um, I was thinking about how like I still use music videos as my mood board for so much before I make a show mm -hmm. and it's because like I don't know it was with Prince it's exactly what you said like I had to make a really clear decision when I started wearing dresses and skirts at 14 and 15 whether I was gonna let people determine my emotions or whether I was gonna have to build that kind of like 
this is who I am, stay the fuck away from me unless you're coming with that energy that they're coming to Prince with. Mm -hmm. And I feel like music videos kind of allowed it to be archived in a way that like, you know, I'm not, I'm sure there were days when Prince went out and wasn't treated like that, but there's something about a music video where like that history can't change because you can go back and watch it. And, and so for me, I would look at all of Prince's discography and just be like, he's a sex symbol and he's wearing all of this and he's got makeup. And, and in, one of the, in one of the photos of, um, if you go on one of the stills of, of um, that music video, his eyeliner is a bit wonky. And I loved that because I was also not good at eyeliner then, don't watch it now. Um, so it was really important for me as well. Yeah. <laughs> to see like, yeah, the, I love that, like the, Im, like the, the humanity in it of that like, it's not everything is gonna be like slick and cut through. It's it's real and it's beautiful and it's fantastical. It's also mundane and like all of that like links in together. Ah, oh, I love that song. All right, um, we're gonna move on to our next video and it's by it's selected by Sham. You're right, Sham. What are we about to watch? Um, so I am introducing a bit of a. It's not as jazzy and as fun beated as Prince, who's like my favorite artist ever, by the way. But um, so I'm gonna be introducing low key music video called Iraq to Chile. And it's basically about the ongoing protests and uprisings that have happened in, Ch in Santiago and in Baghdad in Iraq. Um, and it basically tackles the question of neoliberalism and what neoliberalism has done to our futures, what it's done to our presence, etc. cetera. Um, and the people's response to it, which is very, very moving. Um, the video couples up with the lyrics as well. So when I talk about the video a little bit later, I'll talk about the lyrics a lot about it. Um, we let's, up. let's run the rhythm. Okay, so I'm mad nationalistic. Um, so the rapper in this is Iraqi, the video director in this is Iraqi, and obviously the video is half about Iraq and half about um, Chile. But that's not particularly why I picked it, even though I'm wearing my Iraq shaped necklace today. There's something that's really insidious about neoliberalism, and the video literally starts with neoliberalism kills people, the burden of business. Believe me, you've never heard a verse as urgent as this is. And for people who are watching that aren't really um, sure about what neoliberalism is, it's the ideology that governments should be small and businesses should be big. Um, and that means, you know, the government basically privatizes um, really important sectors in our world. So like healthcare, education and other services and sells it off to the private sector. The problem is, is that it doesn't work. Um, Neo neoliberals tend to like fulfill their vision by cutting government services such as Medicare, pensions, um, women's shelters, and they deregulate businesses and basically give them free reign to do whatever they want. And by deregulating the businesses, that also impacts our um, workers' rights, it loosens environmental regulations, it um, also destroys customer protection. And it privatizes government's ac uh, assets, which gets government money in the short term, but it loses money in the long term. And they'd ultimately be richer of assets that belong to the people. And um, then the people in turn suffer because they don't have access to these um, privileges, and not privileges, human rights anymore, um, because they have been extorted and been made to be so much more expensive so when you nationalize water supplies when you nationalize um public transport when you national um, nationalize electricity this makes everything available for everyone but when you privatize it it's only available to those who can afford it etc and the united states in particular has embraced this theology more than anywhere else in the world and it's why in the past 30 years their healthcare is in shambles um, the inequality gap continues to grow and why university students there are like in like these enormous amounts of debts. Sorry, I'm Iraqi, we talk with our hands. I'll try, relax that. But 
in particular, what the US has done um, in the past 60 years is, is try to infringe that economic policy onto other countries. And nowhere more has it been more insidious than in Iraq and in Chile. And I'll talk a bit more about that after, um, but I just wanted to kind of introduce neoliberalism as a concept before we go into it. Magic and Maggi, always down with the knowledge. We love to see it. And so like, when when was the first time you like you saw this video and what did it then spark? Because I know like whenever I used to watch like Loki's videos or like Immortal Technique, it was always like, there's so many bars, I can't keep up, but I'm like writing them all down and I'm going and looking and finding notes um, and doing like more research. And that being a way of like, not only sparking what was possible for the future, but just being like, oh, I, you had to learn what was currently happening in order to be able to see how we could change that, which I think is part of what you've introduced with like the privatization plus yeah. um, versus the nationalization policies. But yeah, what, what, what was like the first viewing of that video for you and like what was going on? Um, I guess part of it like reminded me that, oh damn, it was because of this we as a family had to leave, uh, had to flee Iraq and mm -hmm. move into this country. But then mirroring that with all like the images of like global protests happening, um, especially again, what neoliberalism being implemented in Iraq and neoliberalism being implemented in Chile are very, very unique examples. It's been implemented globally, but the way that they infringed it upon those two nations were slim to like, is incomparable to anywhere else because the amount of violence that was um, used to entrench onto these countries to enforce it, Mm. It's something I'll also talk about later. But seeing so many protesters come out and seeing so many, especially the young people in Iraq and in Chile, who were, who basically had their futures completely destroyed and completely threatened, say, this is not our way of life. And even um, when you see the schoolgirls during the protest in the video where the teacher tries to um, galvanize, I guess, on like cultural norms and be like, you are women, like you guys are schoolgirls. Why are you doing protesting? And then they in turn respond like, you're a thief, where is your honor? And how dare you talk about honor to us? Um, so for, for me, it's like, yay, more like ammo for the revolution. I, I'm here for it. We love to see it, we really do. Thank you for sharing it. And like you said, we'll get like deeper into that in a little bit. We're handing it over to Caleb Ferry now. Do you want to introduce your video and then we'll, we'll jump straight in. This is Moses Sumney's doom. If I cry, thank you so much for sharing that, Caleb. Do you want to tell us why you chose that? Yeah, so I chose this this video for, for many things, I think. First of all, the song itself is just beautiful. The first time I heard it, it brought me to tears. Um, and then when I when I saw the, the video, it asked a lot of questions about rebirth. It asked a lot of questions about heaviness, about numbness, even in this adult stage um, that we are or that I am or everyone else is here. Um, I think generally as a black body, there is a lot of numbness um, that we sort of enact in order to protect ourselves from the world generally. Um, and that goes, that is not even just a physical numbness, that is a emotional numbness, a mental numbness that you like, as soon as you step out of your house, like, you just like enter that sort of state of being. Um, so it was very interesting to, to see that play out, especially through the visual metaphor of like being in some sort of like uh, womb-esque like situation. Um, yeah, so for me, it really asked the question about, about rebirth, like where even as, a, as an adult, what is there how do you define yourself? Um, how do you like birth new, new aspects, uh, new layers, um, whole new personas, new possibilities of yourself when you are in this like 
in this world, like this human experience, um, can do a lot to to stifle us. But what do we? How do we then like burst out of that? Break out of that? That um, to use the lyrics, that mortal shell. Um, and you know what, what I really, really liked about it was that there isn't a definitive answer to that. And this video is not trying to like answer that question. It's more just trying to pose that question because the answer is very different for every single one of us um, as, as individuals. Um, but all, all it's doing is creating a, a fertile ground, a petri dish for us to like have this like um, this conversation with ourselves. More than anything, I like the stillness of this video. I think sometimes we are so scared as filmmakers to like to 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 keep people's attention. Mm. Um, so we like we we don't allow enough stillness in our stuff, especially a music video which is like so consumable that you take it in and you just like flick it on and and that for a lot of people anyway that's about it so you kind of are fighting to keep people's attention what it, it kind of felt like watching this time just like stops and you just have a moment to breathe so um so yeah so for me it it it, it allowed me to envisage a new way of of depicting heaviness depicting trauma depicting all of this like on a visual level but also it then there was a lot of personal um introspection that it kind of like evoked which is you know my, my condition as a, as a black body and what i what and the potential for rebirth yeah Mm. And I think there's something just like so visually stunning in that piece in particular where, like you're saying, it doesn't give you answers. It's not supposed to. Like art isn't supposed to ram things down your throat and tell you like what to um, do type thing. It's supposed to like invoke um, that inner work or that like inner changings. Um, a friend of mine, Amani Robertson, was talking about like the process of decolonization and it being a series of ruptures and that like similar to that continual getting ready to go outside as a black body or like um this this is like life's work essentially is being able to continue to reconnect with yourself and that you'll they'll have things that rupture and you'll have things that come back but um i think something all of moses's work is genuinely gorgeous and um something that this that just evoked in me is you're in that little like the womb sack bit for so long and then as like that last shot comes in where you start to see there's actually you're not alone in it but you also are alone in it because there's mad like everyone's still in their little sacks but there's the community of like we're all going through this shit um yeah thank and... you for highlighting that I've, 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 i forgot to i would have kicked myself if that wasn't highlighted so thank you no well it, it just yeah it just comes and kicks you in the teeth um and then also just makes you like drop your shoulders and be like, oh, okay, yeah, it, I, I'm feeling all of those things, but also I'm not alone in feeling all of those things. So it all, it, like, and that power in communion and being able to share um, so on and so forth, which I think links into so many other of like the things we've spoken about with regards to neoliberalism or like freedom and like giving ourselves permission to be okay. Um, oh my God, the conversation after this is going to be lit. Um, but we're moving on to our last um, video for today's session. And it is courtesy of Waylon McKenzie. Um, Wayway, Way, would you like to introduce your video? Uh, it's You Don't Know My Name by Alicia Keys. Big tune, Wayland. Let's unpack. Um, this I feel like this video was the one of, if not the first time, I kind of connected with a love story. Um, so this video came out like two thousand three. I'm like six or seven then times. Um, and like by that age, 
that you just get over the 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 people that you like have cooties kind of thing um and this video it kind of presented a love story which i kind of connected with or not that i felt like this is what love is or it kind of gave me a hint of what it might be um i would say the a, a lot of the videos around the time that came out when i was would have been watching it on like mtv base or whatever there were these big grandiose videos and what i really liked about this it was just a really simple love story that's really um that could actually happen in real life like you go to how many times have you gone somewhere met someone and then met them again at another place and it's like but oh, you're that person from the and then just kind of connects and for me personally it kind of taught me how I wanted to reflect the way of making somebody else connect with love through a, a medium. So with, for me, with my art forms, I get a lot of the music that I've made has been about love. And um, the DJ mixes that I make, it's funny, the the, the phone call thing that she does at the, and towards the end is... It's such a small thing, but it's really impactful. Like everybody knows that. I don't think I'd never saw that before. I probably have not really seen that since. It's just an alternative way of telling a story surrounded by music. And the fact that then on top of that, it's, it's a love story just kind of connected with me. So um, in like 2017, I made, I made a mix um, called Ramona's Mix to go along with this uh, project that I made and it's using kind of a similar structure of leaving voice notes to tell the story of a relationship for like in between the different songs um but backwards so I kind of took what they did with this song and this video and then I just kind of using I took the knowledge from before and I kind of just extrapolated it so this video to me is and it's just such a really we can swear in it yeah, yeah, go on with your better. Good song, bruv. It's one of the best songs. It's like in my top five. Um, the production, amazing. Vocals, amazing. And even the timeline at the end of the video, you're like, wait, so did she not call him? Did she call him or what? Like, when did this happen? What's going on? So I'm kind of like Christopher Nolan, Quentin Tarantino shit going on, man. The video's lit. No, it's honestly magic. And I feel like watching it back now, it it feels like so much different to when you're like watching it as a child and what that relationship through the growth into adulthood looks like. Um, and I just think music videos are such a like great way to like follow our growth through our life. Um, but thank you for sharing. And also like hold tight most deaf, he's my favorite. Who Every then went on to I the like Yasin Bey. Come on. There's a lot going on with this video. In fam, bad things are going on. And I love um, it. It's crazy. Uh, huh? <laughs> I love hot chocolate. Like, it's, I just feel representation is important, guys. It's really elite. It's an elite beverage. I don't feel like we talk about it enough. But um, yeah, we move on. Um, and so before we get into taking some questions from um, those of you who have dropped stuff in the chat, so start like ammoing up your questions if you have any. I'd wanted to just like open the floor to all of us. We've seen everyone's videos now. Was there anything that were, like was provoked or things that like came up when we saw other videos? Like where we at? How we feeling? What's going on? And like, feel free to go when or I'll start picking on people. Cool. We didn't get to watch Man Down. So Doriana, what was the, the, the relations yeah. you wanted to make between the two videos? You're muted again. I just feel like technology is not my thing, guys. I'm so sorry. Um, but um, yeah, I just feel like with both of Rihanna, like, so I, I saw Take a Bow first, um, and I think it came out first, actually. Um, but I feel like there's such, like, interesting parallels in the ways in which, like, her music at that specific specific period in her life, like, and, and how old I was at the time that I was viewing it was, like, you're muted again, babes. Oh. Babes, you're muted again such a display of like her 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 music that was coming out at that time was such a display of radical self-preservation and also speaks I think to a lot to the black body mm -hmm. um and the way in which the black 
um, femme body specifically was surveilled and weaponized. Um, and, and specifically in her videos, how she was reclaiming that or reclaiming her body for herself. Um, and I think that that is a conversation that's always relevant. I mean, we're seeing it, especially right now um, in the States, we're seeing it and, um, and it's being displayed and propelled in like, in such a global and international way right now. Um, this conversation about the black body and and um, the brutalization of the black body, all of that. And so I think that that conversation is always relevant, but the way in which she was so, sort of displaying it visually was really radical. Um, and I think I really appreciate her and I appreciate the courage that it took at the time for her to, um, yeah, to give voice and to shed light on that experience. Mm. And the intentionality behind it. Yeah, like, extremely, yeah. Every, whenever people think of like Riri now, it's bad girl Riri. And also there's a gun. Like, I don't feel like there are pop stars who have been so, not like attuned to violence, but like, if you push me to the edge, like I'm going to load my clip. And I feel like that's the thing that we get, which is so different with Riri. Like even just watching the man down video, like, do you know when the, the bullet strikes, you're like... <laughs> It's, oh my God, I love that video so much. And the fact that like the chorus is rom pom 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 rom pom 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 like, Yeah, absolutely. Incredible scene. Yeah, radical, extremely radical, yeah. Was there anything else from like any of the other videos that guys, that like was provoked? Um, or do people have any comments? Davis, I feel, I feel you what you were, um, like the that Prince video, I've always, I've always, that Prince and a few other artists always encouraged that like fearlessness to just be, to just be you, I think. And, and also when I hear like stories about, about Prince as well, they match up to the person who I always felt that like he was, which was um, someone who was just very like unap unapologetic in, in what, and how he wanted to be seen by the world. Yeah. So I was thinking about um, how I actually found, this is weird, again, like it comes back to not internet, not really being something that, I don't know, but I found Prince at the same time as Kanye West. Um, and we're talking, I mean the old Kanye, obviously, but I'm not gonna get into that right here. That's another day, another thing. But I loved Kanye and we were a Kanye household, but we weren't really a Prince household. And I remember, thinking what I was attracted to about old Kanye um, was that, again, well, still Kanye, anyway, uh, was this fearlessness and was this like boldness in like direction and trying to say like, fuck categorization and like, I'm gonna expand beyond that. But with Kanye, there was such a masculinity that was important, but couldn't be detracted from that. And I remember for me, like Prince and Kanye would be on in repetition to try and find this like, fearlessness but from like a gender non-conformity and um yeah I kind of got like it was weird watching it like and then watching your video because that requires you to sit with yourself in a mm. way that like then I was processing the other videos before and whereas like I think a fearlessness sometimes pushes us to work really quickly like okay all this stuff is coming at us so we got to move quick and then yours kind of went okay yeah but then what happens when you stay still how does that pain that you were pushing quickly actually feel? Like, what does it feel like after the fierceness? So I thought that actually the order of curation, whether or not you, I mean, I wouldn't put it past you doing that order yourself, you know, thinking about it, it really, it really <laughs> matters with that, yeah. Hold tight, you earlier for that still. I mean, we're trying, hold tight the team at Civic Square. Come see curators. Um, but I think that's just such a perfect point. And we've had someone like mention in the chat on Hopin, um, so similar to that point around like stillness and how we like push ourselves forward. Um, it's from Dawn and Dawn says, um, she watched the versus battle with Alicia Keys last night and it was really good. But a lot of the comments were like, I fell asleep, yawn. Um, it's, it was slow in places, but the event was for Juneteenth. And sometimes it's nice to have a stillness and heal, but we're continually like pushing ourselves. Like you guys said, um, to, I don't know what we're pushing ourselves for, but we forget that self-preservation, which Rihanna does really well, and which Moses like amplifies in the space of like community. Um, I just wondered if you guys had any comments on 
us breaking past those things and tending to self and healing. And that's there, everyone. Like the fastness of capitalism and neoliberalism. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I feel that I, I do feel like and I think it's generally, it, it even goes beyond this. I think as soon as I pick up my phone, life just like runs at a hundred miles per hour. Um, and, and the pockets of stillness seems to be, or stillness in general seems to be something that is uh, antithesis to online uh, mm. existence, which I think is hugely, hugely annoying and actually very detrimental in the way that we should experience stuff online. Um, there's this, there, there are a few people that do interesting things online where they force you to be very still. There's, I can't remember his name, but there's this YouTuber who like, is a musician, not a YouTuber, but has these like interesting videos where he just sings um, and builds uses acapella to sort of like build a symphony of like music and you kind of have to watch it happening and it forces you to just like stop and um and take it in and before you know like half an hour has gone and you're wondering where that half, half an hour went i think a lot of the time um to be able to really to not even just chat shit. Do you know, a lot of the time I feel like on Twitter, this is a little a tiny Twitter rant. On Twitter, if people were forced to just like take five minutes before saying what they need to say, there will be a lot more progression in a lot of the conversations that are happening. I think sometimes there's this immediateness that you feel to respond, like respond responding to something shouldn't be time sensitive all the time i think a lot of the time um there should be a space where if someone responds to like heavy conversations especially conversations that have to do with with the people's lives like mm. take a minute if there's a way of like twitter just like forcing you to like are you sure you want to tweet this are you sure are you really sure are you really uh, last chance are you sure it will really slow down the process of um of a lot of things. Sorry, mini rant done. I'm gonna start talking now. <laughs> no, it's fine. And I want to link in with like something um, we discussed with Sham, but I guess the way that like capitalism or neoliberalism has pushed yeah. us out of the acceptance of process and just like to result. And that like the dehumanization that we do to ourselves in being so like quick to jump the gun, but then not even think we don't respond, we react. And um, we've got a question from Rachel, who's talking particularly about um, Sham's video, um, who says, getting richer on assets that belong to people, absolutely. How do we change the embedded belief that this is at all acceptable? Like governments, politicians should know better as a requirement for being in office. Um, so linking into what does, what does that, change look like and we're not here for answers we're here for process like I just said but yeah I think I think quickly just going back on um Caleb's point sorry mm. it's it's this it's this process of capitalism that has really warped and poisoned our minds to think we are only worth our productivity and we are only worth our labor when in fact human beings it's quintessential to know that are worth so much more than that um what was the question <laughs> So sorry. Baby love is fine. The question was, how do we change the embedded belief that like this shit's acceptable? It would. They didn't say shit. My bad. Um, I think it's in human nature to understand that it's not acceptable. Again, like the way the way neoliberalism and capitalism is so insidious in the way it's poisoned our minds and like the infrastructures of our minds to think, you know. Um, Human nature is selfish. Human nature is greedy. Human nature is to want more for ourselves and less for others, etc. And then time and time again, every time humanity has been provoked into being selfish or being greedy, 
Um, and I mean like society as a whole, not like these big businesses and the 1% of the elite. Um, we have always ch chosen to strive for more and are always chosen for in favor of unity. So to bring a few examples, when Hurricane Katrina happened and you know, you had residents who had just lost their homes and had nothing to their names, their very first response was to get on the boats and try and look for other survivors on top of their houses and stuff. Where whilst you, ha you had the government basically ignoring what was happening and Kanye West speech, George Bush doesn't care about black people, facts. Um, and then when you look at the example of Greece, I suppose, and Greece, like for the past few years, Greece has faced this huge economic meltdown, right? Um, no one has money. And then when the migrant crisis happened and when, you know, hundreds of thousands of Syrian refugees were fleeing their homes um, because of um, Islamic fundamentalism and whatnot, you had people who had nothing to their names open up their homes, create safe havens. Like it was really important for people to understand that refugees are welcome, et cetera. And th th there's many more examples like um, that I could use. Again, like you see, see time and time again, whether it's um, the, Shia, um, the Shia genocide and the Kurdish genocide in Iraq that happened and Sunnis, um, Sunni Iraqis opening up their homes, whether it was certain regions in Western Europe um, um, hiding Jewish people from Nazi pogroms, etc. The natural human response is in to invoke humanity, is to in to protect one another. It's it's not it's not this again this warped capitalist idea that it's all about me and it's all about my selfish human nature. Every time humanity has been in a crisis or people have been in a crisis, the natural response has always been to help to ensure that we're all okay collectively. So I think it's already ingrained within our DNA to change the system at hand. And we see that with the protests in Chile, with the protests in Haiti, with the protests in um, Iraq. You see um, the uprisings all over the whole, the Black Lives Matter right now has invoked a huge global response. I remember seeing on Twitter, like people being shocked that in, um, in Tokyo, Japan, there was like 7,000 miles worth of protesters turning out. And again, I think it's just already within our DNA to stand up against it and call it out for what it is and want something better and want something different. But the powers that be from the top down right now is our biggest challenge. But as always, they're the minority and I think a big part of it is not being embarrassed to do that calling out either because mm -hmm. we feel like we're going against the grain or we feel like some of our people won't like around us won't understand us. Um but I, I, from some of the things that I've been seeing in the last couple weeks with like BLM in the UK and all of those different things, there's a real like colonization of the mind that moves us away from healing, that moves us away from like what is possible and thinking about the possibilities and sometimes moves us away from our humanity because we're in reaction, we're in reaction, we're in reaction. And so we don't slow that pace in order to see what's going on holistically and that that, um then impacts like what ends up coming out but it's the world be out here man it's just it's really it's really out here and i don't know if anyone else had any other points on um maintaining the slowness um and how we move not just forward but like accepting our past our presence and giving ourselves permission um to be i feel like it comes back to like the kind of work we're allowed to consume and show as well and mm -hmm. particularly like back to the stillness of like moses work as well because i feel like it's only certain people that have to make work that figures out all the answers in three minutes and 25 seconds and i feel like it's only certain people that are made the work that aren't allowed to access abstractness or aren't allowed to access allegory or aren't allowed to access all these like age-old ways that we've had of telling stories and suddenly i think in this neoliberal capitalist whatever those words we may be using this modern age of making work there's such a pressure on black art to not only give you something that's quick paced, but give you something that says the issue, solves the issue and gives you a future all in three minutes and 25 seconds. And I think that we're not allowed to access black abstraction. We're not allowed to ac access, blackness for me has always been outside of binaries. Blackness has always been outside of definitions. Blackness has always existed as a complication. And I think while cap this 
form of capitalism we're in now is forcing black art to do things that it's actually never intended to do, mm. uh, which is answer their worries and anxieties. Mm. And if we're answering the worries and anxieties of capitalism, the work's always gonna feel a pace that just doesn't work because capitalism is this pace. So I, I, I think it's really interesting to look at these videos and be like, what happens when people resist that pace? Uh, they're doing more than just creating stillness. They're actually like, get the fuck out of my lane. Like that's what watching that, felt like I was like actually not even a lane like you put me in a lane I didn't want and so I'm really excited and hoping that after this moment another moment right another moment of collective uprising that we've been on before I'm hoping that after this what we see is black artists be able to feel like they can make work that doesn't have to answer everything because it's not our job I don't know that was a rant too so tell them tell them sorry no I felt that on a spiritual level um I don't know if anyone else had any more points before I pick up some um, more questions from the chat. We're also, we've had a question, can we play man down? And I'm just gonna give an executive yes. So we'll end with man down. Um, a little bit later. So does, does anyone have any comments on anything? Rumination, Hi. knowledge nuggets on top or just building on what everybody else has said i think that's sort of why you don't know my name sticks with me because we like a lot of the time black art is based on black trauma and it's like that's just you don't know my name it's just a happy video about happy things there's a fight in the party but at the end everybody's calm like the cabinet got broken but those things can be replaced it's just about finding joy in our art and our art not always having to come from a place of pain or having to solve the world's ills every single time so that's um i think yeah so that's kind of why that video sticks with me because it allowed me to understand that that art has value as well mm. the biggest of tunes and just for i know there are a lot of people who may have seen some of these videos for the first time might not be linked into the same like networks or art that we view what are, where are some of the spaces or like the artists making work that speaks to that obviously we've got like, a lot of them that we've shown today but like who do we want to like raise up and shout out caleb's one of my favorite directors so i think you should watch his videos wishbone bad boy um but yeah that's me oh snap <laughs> um Denning crew is someone who who's uh whose work constantly inspires me um she's an amazing filmmaker so check her out and she's from peckham as well that day, so come on shamu yeah um, not to copy or well not like like I mentioned earlier I really am like such a huge Prince fan and for me one of my favorite Prince videos is When Doves Cry and I, I think because it like it, it gets the stripped back nature but then it's also so very Prince and one of the like as previously mentioned before like Prince is on like a huge whole nother level when it comes to self-expression like especially in that era and that time like no one was really doing it like prince was the it person like not madonna not no one else like it was prince um and then seeing like especially with when dogs cry i just seeing how um black art in particular is copied um as it always is i like that's just one of my that's what i'd recommend <laughs> Oh, I'm on mute too. Um, Travis? I was going to let, do Joanna, do you want to? I did that whole rant earlier. You go, you go first. <laughs> um, I haven't really, I have to be honest, um, some of my favorite inspirations or, or Black artists in general are like exist in the wellness community. Um, not speaking too much to videographers and um, that of the such, but I would definitely recommend Dion Ivory um, 100% based in LA, incredible black artist who's doing a lot with photography and, and also dabbles in film. Um, and also Lauren Ash is another incredible um, black femme artist. 
and um, wellness practitioner who exists in photography and, and sometimes dabbles in film as well. So I would definitely say those two. Um, I'm so excited to check these out. Um, I was thinking about it earlier. I'm so glad the question got asked because I was thinking about online and who for me occupies a really exciting space making online work. And for me, it has to be Danielle Brathwaite Shirley, also a Peckham South London artist. Um, she's a black trans girl who made something called Black Trans Archives. And basically she creates video games online where people can go through a virtual experience, but she makes all of the soundscapes, all of the words, all of the music with it too. And it takes you through, she's, arch she's basically interviewed black trans people in the UK over the last year and has archived their responses and made us into video characters. But rather than make us what we look like now, she archives us in what we imagine us possibly looking like or wanting to look like. Um, and it's incredible um, because the music is so transfixing, but you have all these different journeys you can go on. And um, yeah, the other day, I went, I've, I've known the work for a while, but the other day I went back to it and I was like, I've got 15 minutes, but I, I like opened my eyes and it was an hour and a half. So yeah, Danielle Brathwaite Shirley, I love it. Amazing, amazing, amazing scenes. And like I could read off a load of them for days, um, especially in the music video space. I think, well, I'll talk about inspiration and then some of those who I want to like shout out, which includes um Caleb, like the first time, I think like your first video I saw, what was it? Children of the Norm. Did you direct that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. That was that was to have I watched it with my mum and we were both crying like <laughs> Um, but yeah, like the, just the things that have, we've been able to like see as possibilities, definitely everyone check out, um, Caleb's work as well as Adiemi Michael, who we were in conversation with the other day. Um, oh, there are so many. And just like those who are almost like our, not like our forefathers, um, Khalil Joseph, um, the work of Adam Curtis and also um, Hiro Mirai, like just specifically in terms of their like direction, I would recommend everyone go and check their stuff out. Um, we'll put a list up of some of the people we've mentioned and just like some more, so like keep sharing these people's work, pay for them, give them money, like celebrate, share and stop like polarizing experiences. That would be real great. Um, I, we're gonna go around one last time and just, do like a quick update of what you guys have coming up and where people can find you. And then Rihanna's going to sing us out with Man Down, Ram Pa Pa Pam. We're going to start with Doriana. Well, uh, what I have coming up. Yep. Um, um, and tell them a little bit more about like your, your work and stuff coming up and where we can find you. Um, so you can find me at, um, I have two websites. One is for my brand, which is um, the the Diaz Collections, LLC.com. And you can find my personal art and writing and all that other good good at my um, personal website at DorianaDiaz.com. Um, and the same thing for my Instagram. Instagram is at by, by Doriana Diaz. Should I put it in the chat? I feel like. Oh, we love that song. And we'll make a okay. cute little Twitter thread because we're in the 21st century. Oh, we love to see it. Um, Sham, do you want to tell us what you've got coming up um, as part of this festival, life, and where we can find you? Um, Monday, 7 p.m., we have a workshop on a future without policing and prisons. And what it would really look like, you know it, what it would really look like to abolish the whole system as a whole and have, um, I guess, community guidelines, basically going forward so we have that Monday 7 p.m because a cab forever and then the 25th as part of the book club that I found we're discussing a, um, a documentary on South American socialist leaders called South of the Border 6 p.m and then next week we'll be discussing Country Under My Skin about um, the Nicaraguan revolution on the 30th so it will all be available on A's for Activism's Instagram and I'll link that thank you my love and yeah follow a for activism's work like they're doing the damn things and it's from berm so i will always support um travis where can we find you what's popping um i'm i'm moving house so no one can find me at the moment but um i'm resting 
So um, you don't, there's nothing that you can find me, unless you want to look at me rest, but there's no makeup when I rest either. So it's also not popping. Um, at the moment I'm resting and following uh, the Free Black Uni that's set up by Melsdot and I'm learning and I'm reading. Um, so that's where you can find me somewhere. You'll know if you go to that page that I'll be somewhere on that page reading. Uh, so you can imagine me there. Um, and that's it. Cause uh, I, you'll see me again when theater exists in 2040. Yeah. <laughs> and you can find Travis at Travis Alabanza um, on Twitter and Instagram. Um, Caleb. Yes. Uh, so, so I've got a book coming out. Oh, yeah. um, it's coming out in November. So that's cool. But you can pre-order it. If you if you go on my socials, uh, Twitter is Caleb Fenny underscore. Instagram is Caleb Fenny and it'll be there. Uh, but generally, I'm just here, man. Uh, yeah. Incredible scenes. Uh, go follow everyone's work. Wayland, where can we find you? What's coming up? Um, right now, I'm at BBC Sounds. So I'm editorial head on, on a lot of podcasts. Um, one particularly that's coming out the next. is It's still June, isn't it? I mean. Yeah. In July, um, <laughs> it's called Our Hands World. And I also have my own series that I produce for Transmission Roundhouse um, called The Green Room Press. It's an audio editorial newspaper. Last week's episode was on the Windrush scandal. Next week's episode is on uh, mental health. Basically, my brother stopped this black man jumping off Tower Bridge because he wanted to go back to Africa. Crazy story. That's what's next. And yeah, I'm just out here trying to not lose my mind because of white supremacy. Social yeah. Wayland have a like Wayland W E Y L A N D M C K. So yeah. Man, like thank you everyone for sharing. And um, please make sure we're all looking after ourselves, drinking our water, dropping our shoulders, connecting with nature. And I'm gonna stop being an auntie now. I hope you're taking your vitamins. That's my new trademark. Um and thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you for your patience with our technical difficulties. And we're, my, my favorite Bayesian, apart from like my family, um, is gonna sing us out with Man Down. Thank you for watching guys, over to Rihanna.